And at this time, I am so privileged to introduce our guest speaker for today. I met her for the first time this morning, but I always already feel like we're kindred spirits. Um, she has ministered around the world. Uh, she's part of a generational ministry family. She's an evangelist, a missionary, a prophetess, a pastor. Um, her and her husband now equip pastors and ministry leaders as they travel around the world. And she is, she has some really good stories. I don't know if you're going to tell the same stories at 9 a.m., but I encourage you, buckle up, get ready to receive from God from our very special guest, Pastor Nancy Clark. So good to be with the people of God this morning. Thank you, Pastor Carrie. Thank you, everyone who's just... Uh, been here, just been received with a lot of love. This is a loving church. Can I hear an amen? Amen. amen. It's been a joy and a fe to fellowship. And uh, I just want to hone in to the presence of God. He's here today. You brought him and he descended upon your praises. Amen. How many of you have feel and, and sense that expectation in the Holy Spirit? Mm-hmm. Yes. Amen. Father, I thank you for this beautiful people. I thank you for your presence here today. I thank you that you have manifested yourself in the midst of our worship. I thank you for the worship team. And Lord, we just give you these moments together. In Jesus' name. Illumine our understanding, open up the eyes of our understanding that we might be enlightened. Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. Darkness covered the face of the earth. God said, let there be light. The stain of sin covered the souls of all men. God sent salvation's light. You will light my lamp. The Lord my God will enlighten my darkness. Jesus, you will light my lamp, light of the world, shine through me. Sing that with me. You will light my lamp, the Lord my God. The Lord my God will enlighten my darkness. Sing it. You will light my lamp. Light of the world, shine through me. Okay, you ready? He is the light, you are the light. I am the light, we are the light. He is the light, you are the light. I am the light, we are the light. He is the light, you are the light. I am the light, we are the light. He is the light, you are the light. I am the light, we are the light. Jesus, you will light my lamp. The Lord, my God, will enlighten my darkness. Jesus, you will light my lamp. Light of the world, shine through to encended hungs. Mi lámpara, Jehová, mi Dios, alumbrará mis tinieblas. Tú encenderás mi lámpara, luz de el mundo, resplendance. He is the light, you are the light, I am the light, we are the light. He is the light, you are the light, I am the light, we are the light. He is the light, you are the light, I am the light, we are the light. He is the light, you are the light, I am the light, we are the light. Shine. 
shine through me. Tell your neighbor, let Jesus shine through you. Let Jesus shine through you. Let Jesus shine through you. Now that's straight out the book. Psalms chapter 18. There's a verse there, I believe it's 29, and this is what it says. For by you, I can run through a troop and leap over a wall. So that sounds pretty mighty, right? But I'm here to tell you the verse before lets you know that David was in the darkness. Because he said, for you will light my lamp. The Lord my God will enlighten my darkness. And then he says, for by you I can run through a troop and leap over a wall. Why am I telling you that? Because we're ordinary common folk that live in this world. And it's not all lights and whistles all the time, is it? But you were born for this day. Tell your neighbor you were born for this day. You were born for this day. I was born for this day. We were all born for this day. This glorious day. We weren't born for any other day. We weren't born way back then. We were born to live in this day and to shine as lights in a dark place. He is the light. You are the light. I am the light. Accumulatively, we are the light. Come on, Jesus, shine through. Come on, Jesus, shine through. Come on, Jesus, shine through. Shine through me. Amen? Amen. I know I'm a little different, but that's okay. I'm sure you're a little different, and that's okay. But, you know, God chooses us as his people. We're his children called by his name. And I want to encourage you today to be these, these common people with an extraordinary power that's alive and working in you. It's not only some folk and some people that have this. All of us do. Once we accept Christ into our heart and we have the wisdom to do what Jesus said, don't you go out until I endue you with power from on high. We've been baptized in the Holy Spirit. They say in the South, the Holy Ghost. We've been baptized in the Holy Spirit, and that baptism ignites us. Jesus told the disciples, I'm sending you out. You're going to make disciples of all nations. But before you go out, it's important that you're endued with power from on high. And that power needs to be working in our lives every day. Being led and guided by the Spirit, Jesus told his disciples in John 14, listen, don't worry. Let not your heart be troubled. If you believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it wasn't so, I would have told you. And he says, I'm going to prepare a place for you. That place, by the way, was the cross. It wasn't just a celestial, wasn't, it wasn't just a celestial home. He made a way for us through the cross. He made a place for us through that cross. But now we get to be the people that know God, that commune with God, know a living and loving God. And because of that, God uses all of us. Tell your neighbor, God has a plan for you. Tell your other neighbor on the other side, God has a plan for you. It's not just another day of living. It's a day of saying, what is the Lord going to do today? Who am I going to meet along the way? What is God's plan for us? And you say, what do you mean? I'm talking to you about common people like us with an extraordinary power. Ordinary people like us with an extraordinary power alive and active and working in us. How Can I hear an amen to that? I mean, God is alive, right? He's not sleeping. He ain't dead. He's living inside of you and his spirit is alive in me. And because of that, we come from, a, we move from a place of commonness to a place of extraordinariness. And so what does common mean? Common means belonging equally or sharing equally for two or more. Having something in common like joint interests. Most ordinary people have an, an audience of common people not having a special designation, status, or rank. An ordinary seaman. It is not distinguished by superior or noteworthy characteristics. It means average. That's you and me. 
Tell, tell your neighbor, that's you and me. We're common people. We're ordinary people, but we carry an extraordinary power. And that power exists not to have a really big show. You say, why does God heal? Because God wanted to show that he could heal. No, no, no. It's a simple. Because the people had a need. The people had a need. The compassion of God comes out. And his spirit comes out because he sees people dead in their trespasses and sin. That was you and me. He sees people without a shepherd. And he weeps. He saw, he saw you and me, thank God. So the power of God is realized because he knows the people had a need. Why did Jesus heal all those people and forgive them of their sins? Because they needed salvation and they needed healing, right? Oftentimes when he healed people, he would say, your sins are forgiven. And they said, who is this that would forgive sins? And he said, okay, just so you understand, you're also healed. Rise up and walk right? The real need is our heart and our soul, that it would be filled with God himself. Isn't that amazing? You see, God's word says the kingdom of God is where? Within you. It's within me. Before the church was a temple, you know, here's the church, he's just steep, open the door, and there's the people. But now who is the temple of the Holy Spirit? We are. In Revelations, it says, behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. And so we have the Spirit of God indwelling us. So what does 1 Corinthians 1 say about ordinary or common folk? It says, for you see your calling, therefore, brethren, sisters, not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. So then who's called then? Not many mighty, not many wise, not many noble are called. Well, then who's called? But God has chosen the foolish thing. That's me. That's you. God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things. That's me. That's you. To put to shame the things which are mighty. And the base things of the world. That's me and that's you. That was us. It's not us anymore. The things that were base, which are despised, God has chosen. And the things that were not, didn't even exist. Why? To bring to nothing the things that are. Why? So that no flesh would glory in his presence. But of him you are in Christ Jesus. All of us are in Christ, who became for us wisdom from God. You are the righteousness and sanctification and redemption that we have in Christ. That is written so he who glories, let him glory in the Lord. I'm going to glory in the Lord this morning because I see a people here who are love God, who are in church on a Sunday morning. Praise Jesus. Hello. That means you love him. That means you, you love him. You've given your life to him. You're serving him. And God has plans for all of us because it's his heart to save this world. God so loved us that he gave his what? His only begotten son. He gave his son so that the whole world could be saved. Christianity is not a club. It's for whosoever will. That's everyone. Come into the knowledge of Jesus. Come into the knowledge of a savior that's been given for us. You know, it's pretty incredible when you think on deity putting on our skin and becoming humanity for us. Deity putting on skin. Why? So that he could be son of God, son of man, so he could give his life for us, and so he could walk around us dealing with the same things. Hebrews tells us he was tempted in all points such as we, yet without what? Sin. So here we are living today, and what time is it? It's perilous time. What time is it? It's the last days. What time is it? It's time for us to rise up and be about the Father's business. What time is it? It's time to exercise our faith. What time is it? It's time to understand that God has called you and filled you with an extraordinary power so that you could do the work of the ministry. That's right. The people of God, Ephesians 4 says, he gave some apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, evangelists for what? For the equipping of the saints. For what purpose? For the work of the ministry. So all of you are called to that ministry of reconciliation, seeing that all men are reconciled to God. Because that's his heart. Listen, Father... Mother, if you've got a prodigal son or daughter, do you want them reconciled to you or not? 
Of course you do. Right now, all over this, this congregation, God is turning children's hearts back towards home. All over this congregation right now, I declare in the name of Jesus, your son and your daughter will come home to your table and God's changing them to understand the pig pen that they're in, to come back to dad's house, mom's house, to know where they're loved and they can be restored. Can I hear an amen to that? Amen, amen, amen. So we know what God has chosen. So where does this power work? Well, the word of God says in Ephesians 3, 20 and 21, and to him who is mighty to do all things far abundantly than we ask or think or understand, according to the power that works where? Say it with me, in us. Where does the power work? Where does the power work? In us. To him be glory in the church in Christ Jesus for all ages, forevermore. And amen. So that power acts through us. That's right. So you are all followers of Christ, filled with the Holy Spirit. I pray so. And you are all listening to the voice of God leading you and guiding you. In that same chapter of John, Jesus let them know. He said, Look, my brothers, my disciples, I'm going to go to the Father, but I want you to know I'm not going to leave you orphans. I'm going to send the comforter to you, and he's going to lead you and guide you in the way you should go, and he will remind you of the things that I said. Huh? So that's the Holy Spirit at work in the New Testament church. And what makes us alive is not religion. What makes us alive is relationship and intimacy with God and moving and actuating and activating the power of God in our lives. Even over the impossible things, we pray and we say, Lord, you are God alone. I declare my dependency on you and you can take something as common as I am and work miracles for me to see the extraordinary power of God acting and actuating and manifesting in the world, in my family, at my work. How many of you need an intervention at your work right now? Huh? Raise up your hand. During worship, the Lord gave me this name that starts with an E. It's Edwin or Edwina, something like that. Somebody has an issue at work. In the name of Jesus, know that God is coming to you and he's going to change the geography. He's going to change how it is. He's going to cause it to come into alignment. We have to know that the power of God is at work wherever we are, not just when we're in church, but when we're in his world, because we are the church. We are that church full of the power. So who are examples of ordinary people, common folk? I just wanted to point out some things in the scripture. I could tell you a lot of people that I know that are common folk, just like we, that God has used incredibly because the power of God has been actuated and released in their lives and ministry. But I want to tell you about what's in the word of God because that's what's going to remain. The words that I share with you, apart from the scripture, you might forget, but the scripture is forever. It lasts forever. The word was in the beginning. Huh? In the beginning was the word, John 1 tells us. And we know that that word is eternal. And we know that he was the word. Christ Jesus was the word manifest to us. So some a few examples. Let's start with a common boy. A common young man who offered the gift of his lunch that fed 5,000 people. A seemingly foolish attempt. Here's my lunch. Go feed 5,000 people. Now, that would seem you want to laugh at that, right? But you know, with God, little is what? Much. With God, little is what? Much. Say with me, much, much, much. With little is much. What does he say about faith? If you have faith, the size of a what? A mustard seed, which is the smallest, smallest of seeds. Just a little bit, you got much. I like that kind of uh, economy in God. I like that little as much with God. So when you're in the place where your knees are knocking or you don't know what you're going to do or how you're going to make a payment, all you got to say, I got a little faith right now today. I'm looking at the reality, but Lord, my eyes are on you. My eyes are on you. And God comes through with his much. And not just enough, but abundance. Abundance. We have a father who loves his kids. 
And we are the loved of God. And God, by his mercy, releases that much to us. So that boy's lunch in John 6, 1 through 14, fed the multitude of 5,000. I shared earlier this morning, haven't had that particular thing happen, but I do know about a staff meeting where there were about 12 people and there were about eight boxes of pizza and there were only about 15 pieces left. And we had a team of young people just come off the mission field and they came home to celebrate and they were hungry. And so when they came into the room, we only had those few pieces. And next thing we knew, they were eating and everybody was eating and everybody had a slice of pizza in their mouth. I didn't see anybody cutting. There were no knives to cut or to share. All of a sudden, every had, everybody had a piece of pizza. And when they left, we as a staff sat there. We weren't paying attention, but one wise woman, and it wasn't me, she said, do you realize that all of those young people had a piece of pizza and we only had about 15 slices left and there were over 50 kids and we just went, ah! We were so excited. So it wasn't, lo it wasn't loaves and fish, it was pizza. Hallelujah. Maybe it's patties that God needs to multiply. I like those patties. That's right. I like those Jamaican patties. Maybe it's the patties he's going to multiply. Whatever it is, we have a multiplying God. So there was an ordinary guy, a common little boy, and God multiplied it. How about the slave? How about Naaman's wife's little slave? She was taken into captivity. She was an Israelite, but she was a slave. And she was trying to tell her master about the teacher, the prophet Elijah, who God used to heal people. If my, if my master knew that there was a man of God in Israel, surely he would cure you from your leprosy because it's God curing. She was taken captive, yet that weakness of captivity did not stop her from sharing the power of God in healing. See, we sometimes think, oh, I can't, because we look at ourselves, and we talk about the problems we have or the conditions we have. I have this condition, so how can I pray for healing for someone else? Listen, Catherine Kuhlman died of cancer, so get over it. Just be obedient to what God tells you to do. Are, aren't we generous at heart? So I'm suffering with this, but I believe God can heal that person. I'm still believing for my healing, but I believe that God can heal that person and extend our hands and share that healing. So that little tiny servant girl, enslaved to be, she could have been bitter. She could have been upset that she was a slave, but she was not. She was gonna share the living God, the power of the living God through the prophet Elijah to see Naaman healed. Was Naaman healed? Tell me. Was Naaman healed? He had to dip in the Jordan seven times. And even then he was a little disgusted because he went to the house of the prophet and expected the prophet to come down and lay hands on him. This is an Old Testament, New Testament lesson. You don't need the hands of someone laying on you for you to receive healing from God. You cry out to God and he will heal you. Naaman, the big captain, famous captain of the army, showed up to the prophet's house. For sure, he's going to come out and lay hands on me. No, he said, go dip in that Jordan. That was the nastiest river you could go dip in. He was a little insulted that he had to go into that river. And one more time, that little servant girl said, you know, if he told you to go conquer this nation and that nation and this army and that army, you would do it. But all he's telling you is to go dip in the river. Surely you can do that. Can't you do that? Seven times the brother went in, and on the seventh time, he was healed. Why? Because he was obedient. Obedient. And by the way, we need that back in the church. We need to be obedient to his word. We need to be obedient to his commandments. Yes, he still hasn't changed his mind. He has given a new commandment. That commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself. But that doesn't mean that you stop obeying the Ten Commandments. I sure hope you're not killing anybody or stealing anything or taking the Lord's name in vain and not having committing adultery. All those things are still the way we live. Can I hear an amen? 
And it's not that God is a control freak. He knew that if you stole something from your neighbor, you probably would wake up dead the next day. He knew that if you disrespected your neighbor by knowing his wife, that you'd probably wake up dead that way too. See, there's, there's a reason why God gives us these commandments. It's to take care of us so we can live in community and in society. I'm not going to steal from you. You're not going to steal from me. I'm not going to take what belongs to you. You're not going to take what belongs to me. But yet I will share, not my husband, but I will share my sugar, my flour, my food, my drink, my whatever you need. I'm going to share it. You say, what do you mean? Well, I'll tell you. Where we live in Lima, the first neighbor we had right next to us. We've had three neighbors since. They each had families and they grew, outgrew the house and they went on their way. The first neighbor came to us one day and he said, I would like to extend my house 10 feet because I'm married now. We married them. My husband and I married him to his new wife. And so he says, I need a two car garage now. I only have one. But there's a zoning order in the town that says that we can't be within 10 feet of the boundary line of each of our houses. And if we build on our garage, we're going to be six feet away from your property line. And we looked at him and we said, okay. And so he said, don't just think about it, but I really would appreciate it. We went back to the house. My husband and I said, we don't have a choice. We have to give him what he needs. God's word tells us we have to give him what he needs. And then my husband said, yeah, we were wanting to plant trees all around, but we didn't want to offend the neighbors. So we'll tell him, yes, you can do that, but don't be offended. We're planting trees. You see, we've planted trees everywhere, all around the perimeter of our property, but we didn't plant trees between us because we didn't want you to be offended. He said, I don't care how many trees you plant. I said, okay, they will be our trees, together our trees. And I said, because I got a swimming pool in the back of my yard and I I've got three beautiful daughters and I really don't want anybody looking at them. Amen. Huh? Not because I'm trying to shut my neighbor out. I'm trying to protect my daughters, my husband and I. Hello. So we had to give him that. And that was glorious and wonderful. And the witness went on with him. These are really good neighbors because other neighbors would say, no, you can't build that garage. You can't come within 10 feet of our boundary line. So you see, we have to be able to give what is necessary for the message of the gospel to be realized because it's not just a preaching message, it's a living message. It's the way that we live and interact with other people and how we are. Can I hear an amen to that? So let's talk about examples of ordinary people. We talked about the despised things and the vile things. How about the thieves on the cross? The thief on the cross was a vile person, openly acknowledged that Jesus was different from him and the other criminal. The vile became sweet. That's the kingdom of heaven. That's the kingdom of heaven. A thief hurled the other he, thief, hurled, he said, aren't you the Christ? Well, then save yourself in us. He was like mocking him out. And the other criminal replied, don't you fear God? We are rightly condemned as criminals, but this man, he's done nothing wrong. And then he says, Jesus, remember me when you come into your paradise. And what did Jesus say? Today you will be with me in paradise. And I like to point out to disturb the religious people. He didn't get water baptized. He didn't say the sinner's prayer. He just simply recognized who Jesus was. And he stood up for, the, for Christ Jesus because he saw his eyes were open and he knew he was the king of glory. He knew who he was. Why? Because that ordinary vile thief on the cross all of a sudden is a, he is the light, you are the light, I am the light, we are the light. He's now shining brightly with Jesus in his heart. Are you feeling me this morning? Let me put it in new generation terms. Are you picking up what I'm laying down today? Are you picking up what I'm laying down? I'm trying to tell you that we are all common, ordinary people, but we serve with an extraordinary power resident in us that should be actuating in our lives all the time, all the time, because God takes ordinary people and does amazing things. I want to give one more uh, example. 
In Jeremiah 36, there was this man named Elisama. And Elisama, he's just a guy that's mentioned right there. And he says that in 1986, outside of Jerusalem, they found the clay seal that reads, Elisama, servant of the king. This was during Jeremiah's time. And so what this does is confirm, oh, uh-oh, Elisama says here, and in, and in Jeremiah, it says in, in chapter 36, verse 12, that there was a guy who was the scribe and the secretary of the king. So now the word of God, there's evidence that the word of God is the word of God, that it truly is the story, not some made up story. I get so sick of people saying, well, you know, Jonah was a parable. I said, thank God Jonah didn't think it was a parable because he needed a real fish to swallow him up. You know what I'm saying? God is at work, but he works through us. Tell your neighbor, God is at work in and through you. God is at work in it through you. And with the coming of the Holy Spirit, how much more a greater power because he is alive in us so that we, would, a common people, ordinary people, would be vested with an extraordinary power, the power from on high. So, you're going to pick up what I lay down? Okay, on Friday, I'm in Massachusetts. I'm taking my youngest daughter, our youngest daughter's two dogs that were dropped at our oldest daughter's house while she moved from Nashville, Tennessee to Massachusetts, Belcherstown, Massachusetts. My grandson, who is 11 years old, our oldest grandson, we have four grandchildren, he's 11. He said, I want to go with Mima to help her with the dogs. I said, thank you, Jesus. I needed help with the dogs, letting two dogs out at the same time on the roads that you don't know. I was so grateful. So it was all said and done, and then we had to return. Had to return on Friday. I had to return on Friday. I couldn't stay there because I had to come here today. So we pull up to a Dunkin' Donuts. Sorry, it's not a tea host, Tim Hortons. We have them in the United States too, right? And I love Tim Hortons. But we were at a Dunkin', a Dunkin' Donuts. So I go to make an order. And this person said, how can I help you? Hi, how can I help you today? I said, how are you today? And this is what the dude said. Blessed and highly favored. My ears perked up, my spirit raised up. I said, oh. I'm talking to a brother. And I said, oh, really? He said, yeah. I said, I'm one of them too. I said, I'm blessed and highly favored too. He said, oh, that is so good. He said, he said, do you want anything to eat? I said, yeah. He took our order. And as we were pulling around the corner, the Holy Spirit said to me, you tell him Psalm 1. I said, Psalm 1? He said, yeah, you tell him Psalm 1. So I get to the window and I look at the brother there and he's got our bag, he's got my coffee and he speaks and I know it's not that voice I heard. I said, there was another brother at the window, right? Taking our order. He said, yeah, he's back here. I said, you got to give him a message for me. Tell him Psalm 1. So the guy, now what day was this? Friday, just Friday. Friday, okay? So all of a sudden, he goes and lives the window. Next thing I know, here comes this dude, brother man with a beard. He's hanging out the window. He said, you have no idea how you're blessing me today. I said, you have no idea how you're blessing me today. Putting your witness out there, blessed and highly favored. I'm going to always remember you blessed and highly favored, but the Lord tells you Psalm 1 today. He said, Psalm 1? I said, yeah. Blessed is the man who walketh not in the count of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight will be in the law of the Lord, and in that law he doth meditate day and night, and he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth his fruit in his season. His leaf shall not wither, and whatsoever he does shall prosper, but the ungodly are not so. They're like the chaff that the wind drives away. They will not stand in the in sin in the congregation of the righteous nor stand in the judgment 
And he looks at me and he goes, you are blessing me indeed. And I said, and you are blessing me because you are not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm in the Dunkin' Donuts getting my coffee and you're telling me you're blessed and highly favored. I know I'm talking with a believer. I know you're filled with the Holy Spirit. He goes, yes, I am. I said, my brother, remember that psalm. That's a psalm for your whole life. Make sure where you planted. Don't be planted on some scummy, slippery bank. You get to the bank where the river of God is because that's where you're going to prosper. You say, what does that mean? How common can it be for you to work the drive through at the Dunkin' Donuts or the Tim Hortons? But that young man is taking his relationship with Jesus serious. And he's finding a way to subliminally witness blessed and highly favored. So can you imagine if I wasn't blessed and highly favored? I'd say, what do you mean you're blessed and highly favored? Well, it's because I know Jesus. See, he's putting the worm out there, waiting for the fish to bite. But this old fish, I bit a long time ago. And I know Jesus, but I had to bless that brother man because he was a common man, but with an extraordinary power at work. And his gift was evangelism. He was not ashamed of the testimony of Jesus Christ. And you know what made me happy? Not only did he make me happy for his witness, but I was so happy that my grandson was hearing all this. You know what I'm saying? My grandson was hearing all this. And I said to him, Ramsey, I said, Ramsey, his name means horn of God. I said, Ramsey, not Ramses, Ramsey. I said, did you hear that guy? He said, yeah, Mima. I said, who do you think he was talking about? He said, he was talking about Jesus. I said, he was not ashamed to talk about that. In the drive-thru, he hung his whole head out the drive-thru with his arms and everything. So when I'm leaving and he's going, bye, I said, Lord, my heart is so encouraged. You know why? Because Jesus has got this. Father has got this. This generation coming up, they are powerful and mighty. They're not afraid of anything. And they are bold and strong. And they're doing the exploits that we're supposed to do in this day. Doesn't that just touch your heart? I left Massachusetts and said, glory to God. Praise the Lord. And I was thanking Jesus that our youngest daughter lived in the town where the kid in the drive through pro- proclaims and confesses Jesus. He has an ordinary job, a common job. But there's something extraordinary working in that young man. Are you picking it up? Are you picking it up? This happened what day? Did I tell you this happened? Friday. God has a people in every place. God has a people as well protecting you. The Lord sends his angels to minister to you. The Lord watches out for your soul. I could tell you so many stories. I could tell you a story of being in Cuba and being so sick. And I was preaching. It was the last night on a Thursday night. The next day I was catching my plane. And the overseer comes to me, he says, Nancy, we have a doctor in the audience and she wants to do an examination on you. I said, I don't need an examination. And he tells me in Spanish, we're a little bit concerned because you're, you're really belabored in your breathing. I said, yeah, I have this gripe, this cold, and it's really bugging me, but I'm getting home tomorrow, I'm gonna be okay. And he says, no, the doctor says that you could die in your sleep because you're, you, don't, you have shallow breathing. And I didn't wanna see this doctor I mean, I didn't. I was going home the next day. So I said, okay, it's the overseer. I submit myself to the pastor. So I've got to submit myself and be seen by this doctor. The doctor listens to me and she says, we got to go to the hospital. I said, oh no, we are not going to any hospital. She says, your bronchial tubes are completely closed up. You've got infection in your bronchial tubes. She said, you need to go to the hospital. And then she said, really honestly, you could go to sleep and not get enough air and you could asphyxiate in the night. And I'm looking at her like, you are just way extreme. But then this is what the overseer says to me. Sister Nancy, God forbid that that would ever happen. But if it did happen, 
we would have a hard time explaining to the Cuban government what a dead American is doing in our home. We cannot risk a dead American in our home. I said, what are you talking about? I'm not gonna die. He said, sister, and I said, okay. So I went to, I went to the hospital with them at night. I said, look, I know how this rolls. They're gonna take me to the tourist hospital and if I have any hair, I'm not gonna have any hair left. I'm gonna get fleeced. I had already given all my offerings and offerings to the church there. I only had a little bit to pay the tax and get on the plane and go home. You know what I'm talking about? So I'm like, I, I don't have anything no more to be fleeced. I'm already gone. You know, I've already given no more hair left. So we walk into this hospital nine o'clock at night. It's dark in that room. Are you with me? It's dark in that room. So the, the doctor, she said, I said, how do I know that someone else isn't going to tell her what to do with me? And he says, she's the head doctor. She's the boss of the hospital. I said, okay, I'm feeling better now. Because I didn't want them to tell me you're contagious or something. You can't go on the plane tomorrow. Then I'd have to buy a new fare and all of that. I didn't want to do all that. I just wanted to go home. So I said to the Lord, okay, Lord, I'm submitting to the leadership. Watch over me. So as we're entering the hospital, there's this little old man. This little old man, are you with me? He's got a little uh, hat on like this, not a cowboy hat, a little beret hat, right? And he's got this old full um, leather coat. And it's so old that the stuffing is coming out of it at the back, you know? And then he's got really dark navy blue pants and this right pant leg is rolled up like when you ride on a bicycle and you don't want to catch it in the spokes and in the chain, so you roll it up. And there is this little man with this little cane and he's walking like this, like this, like this. Walking like this into the hospital and another younger man has got his elbow and then they're going. So I'm thinking, all right, here we go. So we follow him. She tells us, sit down, I got to go check in the department and wait here. There was nobody there. It was dark and it was just me and this other female pastor and we're sitting there and all of a sudden the little old man just starts to go like this and he's going and he's going and I say to my friend, you think the brother can see or not? And all of a sudden my friend, she's a pastor from New York, the brother hung a left on the corner. She goes, well, the brother made a left without a problem. I think he can see. So next thing you know, here comes the little old man again and he comes and he goes outside and I said, man, this little old man, I hope somebody's helping him. Next thing you know, about 10 minutes later, here comes the little old man. He comes along here. He hangs the corner again. I said, you know what? I think he must have dementia or something because he's coming in. He's going out. He doesn't know what he's doing. I feel so bad for that little old man. I go in there to that room. They put this crystal thing on me with a tube to a tank that's green with no signage on it. So for all I know, apart from faith, it could be the Holocaust for me. I could be breathing in some kind of thing that's going to take me out. You need faith no matter what you do, even to take medicine. You understanding me? So I'm breathing in this thing and then there was this little boy crying and he had the same problem I did and he wouldn't take it. And then I said, sit down with me, we'll do it together. So he put his crystal thing on his nose from another tank and together we went, uno, dos, tres, respira, uno, dos, tres. And he did it with me and he stopped crying and, and we were there together and I'm saying, let this not be the Holocaust, please, Jesus. Let us breathe. And the little boy breathed and I could feel my lungs opening and I could breathe much better. So I was so thankful. I left there. We walked out with the doctor. She had her white coat on and she came with us in the car. We had to take her home. And I said to her before we got in the car, I so appreciate you persisting to help me. I can breathe so much better. Thank you so much. She gave me some antibiotics before I got home. So you say, what's this about? I'm talking about the Lord and the power of God that's at work in us and through us in common ordinary people and how that God watches out for his children. So, you know, in Cuba, as is anywhere else, you're in the dark on the road and then you hit a village and then there's the lights. And you go through the village with few lights and then you go out of the village on the same main road highway and then you're in the dark again. So this repeated and repeated, we're in the dark, then here comes the village in the lights. We did this for about 30 minutes. And all of a sudden, I'm sitting in the front. They put me in the front, and we're like 35 minutes down the road. And all of a sudden, I see 
the little old man with a leather jacket, with the stuffing coming out, with a little hat, with navy boot plants, with the right leg, pant leg rolled up, and with a cane. And I said to everybody, El viejito, el viejito, look at the little old man, there he is, el mismo, the same one. How could that little old man get so far ahead of us? Do you think he was really a little old man? Or do you think he was the angel of the Lord? He was the angel of the Lord watching out for me. Watching out for me. I'm telling you this because we serve a supernatural God. That God is at work in us and through us and around us. You are in the palm of his snail-scarred hand, so am I. We have to realize this great power and allow it to work in our lives. The Lord does not want us to be, turn out the lights. The living is over. He wants us to walk in that light. He is the light. You are the light. I am the light. We are the light. Because of the power that works in us, works in you. Whatever your need is, you declare it to the Lord. I'm not talking about greedy, needy. I'm talking about real needs. Healing, salvation, a house, a job, a car. Lord, help me be viable in the earth so that I can share your name and your salvation with others. That's what it's all about. So we have to remember where the power comes from. Acts 1.8. But you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, and Samaria, to the ends of the earth. John 14, 12, verily I say unto you, whosoever believes in me shall do the same works which I've done, even greater works. Who's talking here? Jesus. Jesus saying, greater works are you going to do than I am. Oh, no, I can't do greater works. Well, Jesus said so. Jesus had limited time on this planet earth. Jesus intended for his miraculous power to continue to move through our lives because of his cross and his resurrection. Isn't that right? Isn't that so? So you are qualified to move in the power of the supernatural. You are qualified, not because you want to know, oh, it's a really big show. No, because people have needs everywhere. They need Jesus. They need to be saved. They need to be healed. They need to be delivered. And you are the actuation of his power. Let your kingdom come here on earth as it is in heaven. Daniel eleven thirty two. but the people who know their God will be strong and they will accomplish great deeds. 1 Corinthians 4, 20, for the kingdom of God does not consist of words, but in power. Ephesians 6, 10, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. And Colossians 1, 11, may you be strengthened with all power according to his glorious strength by all perseverance and patience with joy. And so we know that ordinary Christians reject the silly mentality, well, I'm unworthy, or I'm not, of course you're unworthy, so am I. Well, I'm not qualified, of course you're not, so am I. But God has qualified you. God has called you. God has filled you. God has anointed you. Don't give me this little victim mentality thing. Well, you just don't know I've got my problems. There are other people with greater problems. So we need to get focused on the kingdom of God, focused on the Lord. And out of that intimate knowing Jesus comes that power that effectually works in and through you. It's ageless. It's timeless. It doesn't matter how young you are, how old you are. The power of God is realized through you, a believing Christian. We have to put away the pride, the insecurity, the weakness, and for sure all the sins for the sake of the power of God. I want to be used by God so I can't be half stabbed happen. One little foot in here and one little foot on the slidey bank. No, no, no. I'm all in or I'm either all out. There ain't no in between. There's no gray. It's either black or white. I'm either all in and God will use me. You understand what I'm saying? And God wants to use you as a people that are gifted with the power of God. We also know that ordinary Christians, when we unite together in his power, we can do together what we could never do alone. You've heard the, the expression, it takes a village to raise a child. Well, it takes the church to save the world. 
It takes us together to be able to do the kingdom of God and to allow the power of God to be actuated in us. And then finally, ordinary Christians, they flow in the wave of the Holy Spirit. Come Holy Spirit, rush upon your people. Come Holy Spirit, rush upon your people. We yield to you our souls. We give you full control. We want the Holy Spirit to come and to reign upon us with power and authority and might. It's not about a really big show. It happens in the drive through where there's no one else listening. It happens at the bank, at the grocery store. It happens at the mechanic shop. It happens wherever you are because the king of heaven has come through your lives and through your ministry. And there is a great visitation coming and we need to actuate the power entrusted to us. Would you stand with me this morning? Thank you so much for being with us today. I trust that the word of God impacted your heart just the way it did mine. Remember, if you haven't subscribed yet, you can do that right now. And then tell a friend so they can join us and be online with us each week. If you'd like to help us be able to continue this ministry around the world, you can do so by clicking the link below. And I believe God's going to bless you as you bless many others. Have a great week. God bless you.